Deacon Keating, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you. I have to ask, uh, we have been friends for so long, and you have been such a, uh, an incredible spiritual guide for so many, including myself, um, for so long. And you've always made a point of uh, reminding us, reminding me in particular, to live in the present moment. Where are you in this moment? And I have to tell you, this, this moment Oh my goodness, what a mystery The where we are at, not only as individuals, but the world. It, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Yes, and uh, the big uh, common experience, of course, is anxiety and um, vertigo. You might even say spiritual vertigo, because all of our uh, idols are being uh, confirmed as empty. And everything we clung to has been taken from us. Uh, we might say what we cling to is the comfort of ordinary expectation. And so we all expect to get up in the morning and go from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the way we expect it to be. And so even our ordinary routine, which in itself is, is comforting and gives us a sense of peace, even ordinary routine we see as not guaranteed. And so the wisdom of the saints comes back to us again and again. And of course, in good times, we never listen to the saints uh, because we got this. And in bad times, we're suffering so much that a lot of times they can't get their wisdom through to us because of our pain. And so it's quite paradoxical. But the wisdom of the saints is this, that um, throughout our life, no matter what we're experiencing or suffering or enjoying, we should always be uh, sloughing off the excess of our days, the idols that we are drawing artificial consolation from, and we should be seeking holy communion, no matter whether we're in good times or bad times. And so when bad times come or when good times come, Everything is calculated toward reality and peace because we have been suffering the coming of Holy Communion throughout our entire life. And so when people don't have this Holy Communion during bad times like we're in right now, we can panic and we can start grasping at straws and, and thinking that uh, everything is over and ending and anxiety then becomes our normal state. So again, the saints would counsel us when this horrible virus passes, if we could just remember not to go back to being normal Americans, but to go back to him and get our equilibrium set and the substance of our interior life set. So that when the next a reminder that everything on this planet is not um, forever, when that next reminder comes, we'll have less panic and more peace because we will have been living for a while then in holy communion. Mm. When you mention communion for a lot of people, they will, their minds will immediately leap to communion we receive in the Eucharist. And that is not available to most of us now. That it has been that that particular aspect of the presence of Christ is it's still he's still there in the masses that are being celebrated, but for us it's a it's a call to a communion, but a communion of a different nature. Would that be the right way to say it? Yeah, it might even be a time of us to be in solidarity with prisoners, with uh, those who are street mm -hmm. people with the sick, as we all know, some of our relatives are in hospitals now and we can't see them. They can't see us. There's no physical presence at this point. And a lot of human beings live this way their, their entire life or for a large portion of their life, this isolation and this loneliness. And there's a sense here that maybe the Holy Spirit wants us to grow in empathy for those who are always living in a state of only experiencing spiritual communion. We have the great luxury in the United States, maybe even more than any other country, 
if we wanted to drop into a, a mass at 8 a.m. Monday through Friday, we actually can. We, we're spoiled to some extent with the physicality and availability of our own sacraments. But during this time of isolation, we just may want to ponder a bit and ask the Holy Spirit to deepen our gratitude for that. If anything, maybe we can come out of this with a deeper gratitude for the availability of priests in our country and the availability of sacraments in our country, which, of course, is the natural human thing that we take for granted when the pipeline is open so uh, generously for us to receive uh, all of these sacraments, which are, of course, uh, based on physical, real presence, a priest anointing my head, a priest blessing me with his hand at confession, a priest giving me Holy Communion. All these things are physical, of course, and they're necessary for the sacraments. But maybe we can just ask the Holy Spirit for us to ha have a deeper gratitude now and to pray for those people who are in isolation for a greater part of their lives. And this should stir within us, of course, the need to uh, be generous with both our prayers and maybe also our capacity to visit these people when the virus is over. Boy, when the virus is over, <laughs> we're, we're not even clear when that a time will come. Though this is not the first time in history where people have had to suffer for long periods. This type of maybe isolation or uncertainty you know, I'm thinking as recently as wars that have been fought in nations. Uh, for my mind, it leaps to World War II. You know, we're out of nowhere. Bombs were dropping on the sky for the first time onto London. You know, and their worlds were, it's the world of Carol Hauslander, the great spiritual writer who, you know, one day the, the house next to you could be bombed or you're flat and you, the, the uncertainty and children would be sent, were sent away. And so many other things. But yet that period, you know, you go back even further and you have World War I where on the land, in the land of all the great saints in France, you have trenches and mustard gas and destruction. And yet those periods, they came and they went. And it's, it's kind of compelling, don't you think, in some ways that for this generation, when I put myself in that, some of us may want to leap and say, well, this must be the end times because this is so bad or is this a, a major sign? It, and yet this is we've been getting those kind of moments throughout our whole human existence. Uh, what would you say in that for those who feel that this this is it, this is the end? Well, again, that, that comes from perhaps an unmoored uh, fear uh, because uh, with this Holy Communion, that is our normal Catholic state, we would say, not the normal American state, but it's the normal state of being Catholic, to be in Holy Communion. It reassures us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so we live more deeply out of this peace. Um, all these horrendous things that you mentioned, and this current one that we're in, where so many people are dying and suffering, um, it's none of our business to discern the end times. The reason this comes up when these terrible things happen to us is because we finally let ourselves experience our mortality. And normally, during our common days, we shield our mortality with our routine and with the expectations that normally come. So I will have breakfast at this time, and I will meet my friend here at this time, and, and these things actually come to pass. But in times like this, when there is no schedule and things aren't common and expected, we touch our mortality. And that makes us afraid mm -hmm. if we are not in Holy Communion. And that fear, unmoored from Holy Communion, races to uh, an unexpected height. And we have this panic. This is the end times. World War II, World War I the last plague, the last pandemic. Mm -hmm. All of these are always signs that people think the end is coming, but it's not a clear sign that the end is coming. It could simply be a clear sign that we were never as deeply involved with the Holy Trinity as we thought we were, and now we're scared because we're touching our mortality. Wow. 
you know, it it occurs to me that we are entering into this at an extraordinary time. The timing is just so incredible. Um, it, it, while the world, this pandemic, the reality of it began to occur in China towards the end of last year, and those in Europe began to experience it in the beginning of this new year, 2020, it hit our shores, the United States, smack dab in the middle of Lent. We And this has been a Lent like no other. And now as we enter into Holy Week, it strikes me, you know, yesterday as we're recording this, yesterday was Sunday, Palm Sunday, where there was all this joy and jubilation and here comes Christ and the world and crowds and everything. And as this week will end, it will be utter boom, desolation. It will be the day after one week, boom, we killed God. And on a, on a Friday, we call Good Friday. And, and we're living that. I mean, you hear in the news reports, this is going to be the next few weeks are going to be the worst of weeks. And yet, you know, we're living this mystery right now. Is it, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the drama is because we have the privilege of still having electricity, which yeah. a lot of people in wars never had. But as of today, we still have the privilege of electricity. And so my family was gathered around the computer yesterday and we were watching Pope Francis celebrate Palm Sunday in an empty St. Peter's, which I can't imagine any other generation of human ever being able to uh, experience or visualize a lone pope in one of the most beautiful places, sacred places on earth, devoid and empty of every human being. And uh, the drama of this Lent hit very strongly then. And I began to think about uh, the importance of uh, the community, the importance of the church itself, uh, and the importance, again, that we take for granted of gathering every week mm -hmm. and to look ar around on the left and the right and see other people who actually believe. And so that absence of witness at this particular point is stunning. It's as if only one person believes, the Pope. Uh, at least in our visual experience, when we watch these rituals, or in our own diocese of Archdiocese of Omaha, seeing Archbishop Lucas in his own cathedral all by himself, standing in the pulpit with nobody listening to him. Uh, the other thing we take for granted is that we're part of the body of Christ, or the community of Christ. And let's hope that when this ends again, that we might gather together with a new resolve to actually be with each other in faith, to share our faith with each other, to pray together more deeply, to actually give testimony to each other as Catholics, why we believe, how is Jesus real in our lives. So when this isolation is over, perhaps we'll appreciate even more deeply uh, one another. It is a, an opportunity for us, isn't it, to find where he's always been, which we always talk about encountering Christ, go find, encounter Christ. And, but he's always been, at, you know, number one, I, I can't help but think because of the sacrament of baptism, he is, he is now in us. We have been plunged by that yes, at baptism to a sharing of the divine life. And that presence is as real. I mean, that sacrament of baptism I mean, we, we crave the Eucharist, but at baptism, do we even know what happened? I mean, is this an opportunity to come to a greater understanding of that and a reality of that? Yeah, it's, a, it's the classic desert experience. It's uh, akin to a person who makes a 30-day silent direct retreat that um, on the first week of the silent 30-day retreat, a lot of times they're still finding comfort in what they bought. They might have bought some things from home. Uh, they might have bought a favorite book to read. And into the third week, though, they're really being stripped of all of their accretions 
and they're standing alone with God. And God is asking them a lot of questions, and they're asking themselves a lot of questions. And the beautiful thing is that they have a spiritual director there. Uh, that's why, again, places like this, discerning hearts, anything that your diocese is doing online for you, you should really connect with. Because as the weeks stretch on, it can get scary, just like on a 30-day silent directed retreat, where you feel um, the comfort of familiar things has been taken, and you're alone with the alone. You're alone with the holy. You're alone with God. And to be alone with God, stripped of all the comforts and familiarities of our daily life, well, this is where the scripture gets the word fear from. It's frightening to stand in the middle of the sacred because we actually experience, again, our temporality, our mortality, our finitude, our limit. And so connect with uh, discerning hearts, connect with your local diocese and what it's trying to share with you this week. Uh, so that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and the revelation of God from his word and not from the fantasies that you might be experiencing as these weeks progress. The one thing you don't want to do is stay alone in your fantasies, in your daydreams. So you want to connect with the word of God uh, electronically if you can. Even in your home, if you have a crucifix during these weeks, you good to take it off the wall leave it on your dining room table and hold it every so often and just look at him and pray and, and pour your fears into his open side on the cross. He wants to receive everything. As everything is being taken from us, he wants you to know that he will never abandon you. And in these desert times, these times of 30-day silent retreats, these times when the world shakes a little out of our ordinariness, he wants to, you to hear that even more clearly. Everything else may be taken from you, but I will not be taken from you. And this, of course, is what I wanted you to know all along, all along. But you masked it. You covered it over. Um, you were afraid to stand in the holy. But now you have no uh, choice. You must, because it's the only thing left. And in this way, it's sort of a premonition of our death. Everything is preparing us for this moment of dying when there are no more trappings to cling to and we must confront the holy and the sacred and the divine. And uh, he's trying to gently give us this opportunity to be ready for death when it comes so that we don't run from it and try again in a puny, almost comical way to cling to idols. No, they're not there anymore. It's just you. It's God. And this is, a, this is why this time can be a time of great grace. And as many commentators have already said, many people might be experiencing for the first time what Lent is always supposed to be. And Lent is always supposed to be this time where you are alone with God. Yeah, it's, it seems like everything else was a rehearsal. You know, you speak about going on retreat. It, you know, we're very blessed in Nebraska and I know many other beautiful retreat centers around the country. And you, know, you have the food, you have the bedding, you have the, the, the beautiful scenery. I mean, it's really quite, uh, it, it, we're all set. Okay, now I'm going to go and I'm going to go deep. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. But now it, it's as though the rubber has hit the road. No more retreats on your terms. Now it's retreat on my terms. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, and the challenge becomes in, for the, maybe the person who is isolated, like you said, who is confronting things and they need someone to talk to, or it's, how about this? You're with your spouse 24 seven and you're not used to that. Or you see your kids and wow, did they really grow up? And you're, and you're having to really, you are, this is the retreat that he's, allowed this to happen that he he wants with us. It's, it's different, isn't it? Yeah, and it's good you mentioned the, the spouse and the kids, too, because um, analogically, it's very much the same experience. We can be learning a lot about ourselves as our kids chafe against us or our spouse does. Um, sometimes when we go on a retreat, in a really beautiful retreat house, what we experienced was a really comfortable bed and good food. <laughs> 
And we, we didn't really allow God to get that close to us. We might have even cluttered the retreat with a lot of talks and uh, activities. This is why I always say that the only retreat is really a silent director retreat. Everything else is just a conference, a conference in a comfortable place. God, of course, can break through there. But you give them a better chance when you go on a silent retreat with a director and you just start confronting the fact that it's you and God. Just like now you're confronting the fact that you're with your wife 24 hours a day or your, your husband. You're learning a lot about her, about him, and you're learning a lot about yourself in the presence of him, in the presence of her. And we want to remember what we're learning because we want to then, after this virus has passed, to go to our spiritual directors and our pastors and talk about that. Don't forget what you're learning about yourself because God's trying to reveal those rough edges that need to be uh, maybe gently or shorn off by him in prayer or in fasting um, for your own spiritual and moral growth. So I think this time is both a time for human growth, children, wives, sacrament of holy marriage, um, even the meditation on the absence of friends is a very important meditation. How much do they mean to you? What is being lost now and you can't see them? Is anything being lost that maybe you shouldn't have been involved in to begin with? And maybe it's a good break from friends that perhaps weren't in Christ, so to speak. And so uh, it's a time to reflect on many of our choices uh, to remain in the presence and how do we experience ourselves when we remain in the presence of our family, friends, God? Yeah, it, it, this particular retreat, this global pandemic has put us into, There again, it's so different because unlike other places where we may feel safe and we feel secure, there is an underlying fear here because death is truly possible. Illness is truly possible. The harm that can come to loved ones. That, that is a new element to all of this reflection. This isn't, I mean, it's, it's very, it's tangible. Right, yes. My sister-in-law is a nurse in Connecticut, and she was calling for prayers last night. We saw a picture of her. She looked actually, she looked just like a, an astronaut. I mean, totally covered from head to foot. Wow. And uh, one of her colleagues uh, as a nurse has contracted the virus and maybe dying. So I ask everyone listening to pray for all nurses. Uh, so it's real. Uh, death is a large part of this. And um, the reason there's so much fear is because we are acknowledging that death is real. And again, most of our popular culture is a mask keeping us from ever thinking about death. And now that all these masks have dropped, death comes to the fore. And um, it's not something we want to revel in or say, let's look at this in some type of um, macabre way. But we've known as believers that death has always been the enemy. And now we see it. We see the enemy. We've been afraid of the enemy. And again, we've been afraid of the enemy because our Holy Communion isn't strong enough with our Holy Friend, Jesus Christ. And the deeper that friendship grows with him, the more we can confront death in peace, uh, without panic, without fear. Of course, there'll be sadness. There'll be mourning. But the sadness in the morning is over the good things of life. The panic and the fear is over that which we have created in ourselves, which is a habitual stance of isolation from God. And that's what he's gently trying to say to us. This death has always been here. Your limit and your finitude has always been part of your life. Stop masking it. And let's look at real life. And it's okay to look at it with me. That's why I came, so that you could not be alone. When you look at it, 
That's what we call salvation. You're looking at it from the stance of communion with him. That's how the saints die in joy and in peace. So push against the fear and choose the communion. That would be the theme of this um, imposed retreat, I would say. Well, Deacon Keating, I'm hopeful that you will join us in the days to come as we're moving towards Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, and uh, and and beyond all that. I think this has just been, uh, you know, I'm sorry you're in isolation, and and um, but on the other hand, I'm I'm. Is it wrong for me to be happy that we have this time with you? And and I'm glad for your your beautiful wife Marianne too that she has this opportunity to to rest with you at home, and um, and so I, I hope you'll be able to come back and talk with us some more. Sure, thank you. And just encourage everyone to listen to what the government is saying. I know there's some agitation that uh, people are wanting to eagerly get together and worship in groups. And, and uh, the beautiful thing about uh, our faith, uh, Jesus is the Logos, uh, which means in Greek, reason. The beautiful thing about Catholicism is it it entrusts itself to reason. Um, and we have to we have to meditate on that a little bit too. What the government is asking is reasonable because it's basing its uh, assessment on knowledge. Jesus is knowledge. Jesus is reason itself. And so when reason begs us to do something, we're actually being faithful to God. When you're reasonable, you're faithful to God. And it's very reasonable now to stay away from each other, or many more will die. And so um, don't agitate bishops and priests to have gatherings together. It's unreasonable. And therefore, I would say it's unfaithful. Mm -hmm. uh, the Holy Spirit is with you. you know, where two or more are gathered, I am in the midst. And many people are in their homes with two or more. So he is with you. But let's let's maintain the connection between faith and reason. That was a very reasonable thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Deacon Keating. Thank you.